Welcome everybody to the uh, third and final session for the East stage. This is a session on data protection. Before we started here, we had some commentary about our sparse audience, about don't people care about backup? So this is not backup, this is data protection. Backup's in there, but we're talking data protection. And with that, my name is Jim Millard, uh, also Jim Millard, depending on how far north or south you are. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I am one of the organizers of this crazy thing, and uh, I also work for Avar in the Midwest. I'm an implementation guy as well as a pre-sales guy, so I have to deal with data protection from the standpoint of solving problems for my clients. However, I'm not the only person here. I've got a full panelist of really smart people, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, starting with Gina. Okay, hi, I'm Gina Minx and Rosenthal, just depending on who I'm talking to. Um, I live in Austin, I work for Spanning Backup. We were acquired by EMC um, last fall. We do complete SaaS to SaaS backup. My turn? Okay. Hey guys, I'm Nick Howell. I'm a tech evangelist at a new company called Cohesity, where we're focusing on um, not only data protection, but analytics and other copy data management source sort of things. Uh, within a single unified distributed platform. Yeah, my name is GS Khalsa. I work for VMware and technical marketing for storage and availability, focused on availability, so SRM, uh, VR, VDP. I'm Shannon Snowden with Zerdo. We do disaster recovery to different platforms, and I'm senior technical architect, and glad to be here. Right on. My name is Chris Wall. I'm a Leo. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Uh, I blog at wallnetwork.com, and I'm the author of Networking for VMware Administrators. I'm Tim Antonowitz. I'm an independent uh, consultant that has been back from, like, before tape. So <laughs> I'm tape. way back before in the backup. Tape. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> Uh, punch so, cards. Pretty much. Okay, so I, I'm going to kind of dive us into it. I did start off that it's data protection is not backup, but backup is data protection. So I, I would like to get the panelists' viewpoints on how, how you deal with people making that mistake, that, that backups are a way of protecting your data, but there's other technologies out there that are not necessarily backup, and what your thoughts are and how you would put backup versus data protection and Maybe you have a differing viewpoint than me where backup is data protection. So anybody want to volunteer to be first or are we going to go back down the line? Mr. Wall. I think all the terms are just kind of marketing to begin with. You know, in the <laughs> end, it's just uh, how do I get my data back? You know, whether I'm restoring from spinning media or magnetic media or the cloud or whatnot. You know, the, the real value is on how do I restore data and protect it. So pick your poison. I don't want to, I don't want to get too jazzed up over what you want to call it just because a number of folks are, are under the title of backup administrator, and I don't want them to feel like they have to go get a title change. So that's my two cents on that. <laughs> yeah, it's also really about uh, threshold. You know, how long can you be without the data? And so then you start applying the solution toward that. So if tape does it, that is data protection. It's the, the gap that you're not protecting is whether you can accept that or not. And I'd say all of that Plus, um, data protection is all about business. So it's about, just like you just said, it's about how long can you be without that data and still be in business and still be working. Because backups are just copies. And you can copy and paste, and that's a backup. Copy it, you've got it pasted someplace, it's there. But then how, if I need it right away for production, how do I get that data back into the application where it was so somebody can start using it again to do whatever work they were doing with the data? I'll throw one in real quick. Um, to me, data protection is much a, a, a lifestyle, much like the words you hear DevOps or you hear software <laughs> defined or anything like that. Data protection is kind of a mantra of how you protect your data. And as I'll echo what Chris had to say about the most important thing about backups is being able to restore it at a point that you want it back and at a, um, in the time that it takes that's most efficient for you. So I think it, whether whatever the source is, no auditors are ever going to come into a public company and audit backups. They're going to see, they're going to make you test restores to test your backups. So it's not just about doing backups. It's more of a lifestyle of that traverses cloud, tape, offsite, DR, everything, uh, and how you encompass that to build around your business. Yeah, you touched on a good point there about, in effect, it's, uh, there is a discipline of security to it too, uh, protecting those tapes. And where are they housed? So that's definitely part of data protection. Right. It, it, it comes down to 
the value of your data. You know, how much is it worth to you, not just in the, the value of the content of that data, but the availability. Um, if you lose you know, systems or, or data or whatever, what does that do to the rest of your company? Are you going to have 500 people sitting around twiddling their thumbs for eight hours um, while you do a recovery of that data or something? Or is it to the point of you, know, you can't afford to be down one minute because that's actually critical data and time? You know, time is money. And backups as a, as a rule, I mean, that's a, a word that people put on it, but it really comes down to um, the value of, of your data. And, and what value your company places on that. If they really don't care about having everybody sit around doing nothing, just back it up onto tapes and you know, throw it in the basement, who cares? But, but if it becomes an important piece of your infrastructure and the way you work, it, it's something you need to address to make it more highly available. So then what, I, what I'm hearing is something that sounds a lot more like a discussion of getting into RTOs and RPOs for deciding how you're going to back it up, where you're going to back it up, and how you're going to maintain access to those backups. As Nick says, the restore is actually the testable piece. The fact that you do backups over and over and over again isn't interesting. It's, well, the way I always tell my clients, it's not a backup completion until I've restored from it, validated it that way. So. What are your thoughts? I mean, I keep hearing tape, and I, I like to think that that's one of those nasty four-letter words in the industry, but the reality is we still see it. Is that still valid for data protection, or is that more archival, which is more legal protection as opposed to DR or business continuity? There's a lot of, to, to do with tape, there's a lot of sleep well at night that people trust it. There was an old phrase 10, 15 years ago about nobody ever got fired for buying IBM or, but the, nobody ever got fired for using, for backing up to tape. Now, if you have other cloud, fair enough, <laughs> in general, <laughs> forgive me, <clears throat> um, with cloud and we see all the breaches and stuff like that. So doing archival to other sources, uh, as opposed to tape, now you enter into some more risky ventures by getting into that potentially. So I would say you still see a lot of tape. I think it's potentially going down, but at the same time, the tape vendors continue to innovate. They continue to drive the capacity of those tapes up bigger and bigger, and they stay more cost effective. And I think if you look at a lot of surveys and research data on problem and pain points that people deal with when it comes to data protection, the number one reason is almost always cost or the uh, answer is always to do with cost. She's about to burst, I wanna, I wanna give you. So can I ask the audience a question? How many of y'all do backups as part of your job? How many of y'all back up to tape? Of the ones that back up to tape, and anybody, if you backed up for, I mean, I haven't done backups in ages, but I used to be the backup admin. How, what is the percentage you see of restores working from tape? <laughs> Step one. Right. Yeah. Step one, find the data. Find the data. Go back to the place it was. Make sure it's indexed correctly. It is a huge pain. Make sure and then I have a drive that can read the tape. Make sure you have a tape driver at this point that can read the tape if you go back far enough. At this point, tape only makes sense for archival applications. But, but what? And, and, and even more so for archival applications where the customer leaves the tapes in the library. <laughs> can't lose them because they're still in the slot in the library. But the, the point I'm trying to get to is, is some of, sometimes you have to do whatever the environment's set up to do and you have tapes. I know when I restored tapes, it was like a 75, 25%, 75% 75 of the time, I wasn't getting the data back, so I got it back as close as I could, but I couldn't get back to where I needed to get to. And it was just hard. So tapes are hard and there's better technology and we should probably be thinking about if it's possible for your organization to move, to think about moving. That's my two cents. One of the things, you know, this conversation is really a lot like talking about insurance policies and insurance. So the people that are looking at different solutions oftentimes uh, away from tape because they've suffered some sort of outage to the point where it hurt. And so if it's not hurting, it's insurance you hope to never have to really cash in on. So tape stay around, um, maybe some sloppy practices stay around, but when you suffer that nearly uh, catastrophic issue, uh, then you start looking at more robust solutions and you get into more dynamic data protection maybe than what we consider tape, even though it's a good archival tool. 
tool. I don't know, I disagree. I think tape's a poor archival tool for a lot of reasons. One, it's the Hotel California. You know, you can't <laughs> easily get data out of it. Well, that's that, why. that very much depends on scale. Yeah. If you've got petabytes or exabytes of data. We gotta get an extra chair out here. I would get guy. a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Oh, he's got his own mic. Too. He's got his own mic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this day and age with the technology we have, there's much better Thank ways. Come on up, Howard. <laughs> I'm standing anyway, so that's okay. <laughs> so our, our, our guest panelist, to join all of our other guest panelists, go ahead and introduce yourself, Howard. Yeah, I'm, I'm Howard Marks. I run uh, Deep Storage, which is an independent test lab and analyst firm. So you care about storage? Excuse me? You care about Cares storage. Deeply. I, I care deeply about storage. Yes, but yes. you don't care about tapes. Um, well, it's storage. You know, first, of, <laughs> first, first of all, we have, we have to stop the really bad practice of taking a pile of old tapes at Iron Mountain and calling it an archive. That, that back, backups and archives are inherently different. Yep. That right. you back up to recover or restore and therefore the index on your backup data is where did these files or objects come from because I want to put them back where they came from. Your archive is when you want to retrieve data later for some purpose different than putting it back where it came from and the index structure has to be different. And a backup tape makes a really lousy archive yeah. but a 4,000 tape library with LTFS and the right software to drive it makes a really good library. But a 10 tape library should be replaced by disk. That tape doesn't work effectively except at scale. The more data you have, the more attractive tape looks. So, wh so and, where did And the colder your data is, because with tape, um. the media is cheap and the drive is expensive, and with disk, you have and, to buy them together. And that, that's where I'm, there. I want to go there next. I I'm, I'm want to interrupt and say, what about the arguments that tape is cheaper? But you're right, the, the individual media cartridges for tape is cheaper by the gigabyte or the terabyte. But, but the drive, right, a tape drive is $2,000. A disk drive is $200, roughly the same capacity. But that tape drive can have $5,100 tapes that store the data. And so that's, it's that ratio that starts to be cost effective. If you've got well, but 300 the, the terabytes. The reality is, in your, in your argument to start with, which was small scale sucks, large scale works, well, you, might, you, might have, <laughs> you might have three or four drives that you would want to have just for uh, you know, parallel restores or parallel writes, and that's fine, those are two grand a piece, and then you've got several hundred tapes or a thousand tapes you put in the library, but then you start talking about all of that being in integrated together, and there's what, two, maybe three companies that even make a library that that's, that's that big, and in order to buy one of those, you're talking six figures or more right, like I before said. you even put the tapes into yeah, it. Like I said. So in which case. If you, if you have moderate amounts of data, Tape is dead. The, the market for tape is bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and so what and we're, keep, what we're seeing now. It's getting longer and longer and longer. So if you're CERN, when you run the Large Hydron Collider, it generates five petabytes of data in four and a half seconds. And that gets written immediately to tape because they don't know what they're going to do with it yet. And then they start retrieving pieces of it for analysis. It, so it, we, get, we move away from it, it's the barbecue. It, it's the barbecue analogy. You spend three thousand dollars on a, a top of the line smoker to roast cheap cuts of meat slowly. <laughs> yeah, and and unless you're eating barbecue every night, it's cheaper to go to the barbecue shack. So we're we're moving then towards what do we replace tape with in order to protect our data? Mm -hmm. And you essentially have more spinning disk or flash type media or you don't own it, somebody else does. Right, it's and my, it, and it's it my spinning matter. disk or somebody else's. Well, you have object storage, essentially. So mm -hmm. you can do it on-premises, off-premises, so it's really relevant. But the concept of object storage, which scales out and allows you to easily make that giant library, add and, add and remove nodes from it, is, is essentially where you're going to want to put that data. Now, underneath the covers, it's spinning disk or flash or whatever the heck it is. But ultimately, that's, I think, the next gateway to 
eliminating tape. And it also gets rid of the complexity of running a disk-based object store and a tape-based system side by side. I agree. You see, you see a lot of companies coming out now that are doing a lot of commodity hardware stuff, but they're layering distributed file systems on top of it to create these multiple node clusters that can be carved out to hold certain houses of data, whether they're immediate backup or whether they're archival stuff or whether they're actually being used. So instead of taking all of this data off-site or making it somewhat useless by throwing it onto tape until you need to recover it, you can now repurpose it for other things like cloning or um, analytics work or informational um, queries that you might give to your business to make business decisions. So I think backup is cool to an extent, but if you can make use of that data and still have it as a backup, it just it makes it even more powerful and more, it makes it worth the money you have to spend to, to store it. So one of the uh, uh, vendors in our industry, Veeam, likes to tout the 321 backup data protection methodology, which is you want three copies of your data, two of them on different media, one on two different media types, where one of them is off-site. I run in my regular business to a lot of people that are barely even getting the two copy thing because they're not always doing good backups. How, what do you see to be able to reach that, assuming it's even a valid premise? So, so first, is the premise valid? Three, two, one. Is that really today's, the way that we protect data today, is that a valid premise? And then second, if it is valid, how do people that aren't there yet get to it more readily? I think with, with most things, I mean, as far as whether the, the three, two, one thing is valid, it's the standard consultant answer. I think it depends. You know, if, you know, what are, what is the risk of you losing that data? You know, there's some, some situations if I was, uh, you know, there's that show going on right now, the uh, Mr. Robot, you know, if I was protecting credit bureau, you know, credit data for customers throughout the US, I want probably a lot more than three copies of that data. You know, I want and I want them in multiple secure locations, not just one. Well, so, is, isn't it more about the re reproducibility of the data than about the sensitivity of the data? You know, if it's, if it's data I can rebuild, then I need fewer copies. Right, and, and, it, and again, it depends. You know, does, yeah, it, it, can I reproduce it some other way? Then yeah, maybe I don't need that many copies. Maybe I don't need any copies if I can reproduce it. Yeah. Through the a, reason you yeah. keep one copy of your Oracle database and like two to three copies of your log files, because you can always go back to a point in time on your database, but you have, have multiple copies of the logs that you can roll back into the database to bring it back yeah. up. So perfect example of that, yeah. Okay. I, I just add, that, that premise of the 321 is built on kind of archaic technology terms. If you think about using object storage in Amazon's S3, all of that data is chunked and sprayed across a number of avail availability zones. I mean, you'd have to lose a pretty big geography of the United States or whatever region you pick to really lose that data. I mean, they prove 11 nines of availability on that data. So, you know, 10 million files, you'll lose one, something like that, or 10 billion, I forget the exact number. And that 321 rule doesn't really take into account technologies that are in the underlay like that, nor does it take into account things like erasure coding and deduplication at scale and things well, like that. No, Chris, it does. Because the three is, I've got my production copy on production storage. Mm -hmm. I've got an on-site copy so that I can do a quick recovery. And I've got an off-site recovery in case the damn building burns down. So I'm going to speak up in Chris's favor. It doesn't make sense in a, if it makes sense on an on-premises model. But if you're completely in the cloud, it doesn't matter. Well, then, then if, if my compute is in the cloud, then same location, the, the definition of location changes. Yeah. Well, and, the premise and, was, and, and it I was Veeam's advice. They're not giving you advice to go to Amazon. What's that? Exactly. A actually, they're fine well, with that if you're that, using that, that, that as last, a remote copy. That, that, that off-site copy is perfectly fine in S3. And if I'm using AWS, mm -hmm. then a copy in, in S3 and a copy in EBS is perfectly fine. But, you know... At, in, the, in the truly paranoid storage guide days, mm -hmm. I go, I don't want to have one copy on S3 in multiple zones because there could be a software bug in S3 that kills them all. And I, I want different vendors' responsibility. Well, and, and different sets of test data. I'll, I'll take it this step further that S3 could be perfect, but what I'm using to get it there could have the bug. Mm -hmm. So 
it doesn't matter how secure or replicable or protected S3 has made the chunklets that we put up there, if I write the wrong chunk, shame on me. Yeah. Or, or if you look at the code spaces case yeah. where somebody guessed their password and deleted all their data out of S3. You are responsible for your own data. And that's when it goes to the cloud, that's absolutely true. You have to still think about backups, even if you're using a SaaS model or a pure, any kind of cloud model. Well, especially if you're using a SaaS model. Yeah. Because, I would agree with that. In, in, because, in, <laughs> well, I mean, if you, if you, and here I am making Gina's case for her, but if, if you backup exchange on, in your corporate exchange server, that backup serves two purposes. It protects your data against exchange failures, whether that's hardware or software, and it protects your data against human errors because when the executive vice president calls and says, I have been storing all of my important data in deleted items and you just emptied the deleted items folder and we're gonna have you fired, you restore that data. If you go to Office 365, they take care of the first case, but they do not take care of the second case. Right. If, you know, if you call up Office 365 and you go, my executive vice president was a moron and he deleted all of this important data, they're going to say, well, he clicked the delete button, right? And you go, yeah. Works as designed. And they, <laughs> we did exactly what we were supposed to. What you want them to do. We, you want them to delete the something when you say delete yeah. it. So. Right. But, but that, but. The, you know, the user community has come to rely on us to save their bacon. That's right. And you need something like spanning or Backupify if you're using Gmail or Office 365 to store that data where it can be restored when your users are idiots. Anybody here have 100% users who are not idiots? Yeah. Well, I'm the only person <laughs> in my company, so I'll, I'll raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the whole concept of how many copies, um, it really doesn't matter. What matters is recovery time. Can you meet your SLAs with two copies, three copies, ten, however many it takes. If you need to have that data back online in five minutes, two minutes, ten seconds, whatever your, your SLA is, that defines the number of copies and the availability of all of that data and how fast you can recover it and get it back online. To an, to an extent, yes, but there's also certain uh, situations where uh, public companies will have auditors that come in and they, they dictate to them, well, not really. You write your own policies, but they come in and make sure that you're adhering to it. So if you're telling them that you have, you have, you're keeping two copies in two different locations and one copy off-site, they're going to come in every six months and make sure that that's exactly what you're doing. And, and make you test those restores. Well, and we've, that, we've and that 10 minute SLA has to, explicit, exactly. has to explicitly cover and the damn building burnt down. Or I can meet the 10 minute SLA and when the building burns down, not have any data at all and go, hey, I met the SLA. Because yeah. you know, we didn't talk about the building burning down. That's part of that risk down. assessment. Well, and there, there can be regulatory things that, that have nothing to do with public versus private that if, if you're a fuel hauler and you've got excise tax data, you keep that for 11 years. Yeah done. So if it's today's data that hasn't been through a backup cycle, how do we, are, are we getting out of the concept of backup? This is where I was going to start with, that data protection is different than backups, because most people, when they're thinking of backups, we're thinking of the nightlies, right? We're thinking of, we've got a job that runs and it sweeps something nightly and that becomes our nightly backup. Now, Anybody who's worked as a DBA knows that, well, I do my full backups nightly, but I'm doing transaction log backups on X basis or whatever. We've got something that's happening more than daily, but we're still, when we want to get RPO, RTO down to that, call it the millisecond, the 10 minute, the one minute, some small time frames. Let's get out of the, we keep doing backup, which is unsurprising, but how do we get into protecting our data that's not backup related because the RTO, RPO is so short. We've got, it's either a business need because we're you know, looking at millions of dollars per hour being lost because of the nature of our business. It's regulatory that if we lose even one medical transaction going through our ER, EMR, we're looking at a multi-million dollar lawsuit potential. What do we do to deal with the really small data loss cases where, Nick, uh, so you're, before we get to the really small, so the, for me, when, it, when you really boil it down, backup comes to, down to a discussion of medium 
Are you going to use tape? Are you going to put it on the, in the cloud? Are you going to use disk to disk? Whatever that is. When you're talking about creating jobs like you were referring to, it's just a discussion of which medium are you going to use? Because all of them now have the built-in and the schedulers of setting SLAs, all of the table stakes things. Almost any of the backup vendors out there um, will have all of those things. But to get to your point about the, um, uh, the SLAs and getting down to those small times, it's not so much about the software. It's, uh, sometimes it's about the, the, the things that you would tie a, an SLA like that to would be higher end applications, not necessarily Betty Sue's spreadsheet that she keeps in her user drive, right? So it's almost as if the application or what you're backing up drives what that um, RTO is going to need to be. So if it's, 10, if it's Oracle, you might need a copy, a snap every minute, right? But you're going to have a baseline somewhere that's going to be, you're going to be able to roll back to. I think, too, it, it, it comes down to talking to the business and the IT organization talking to the business about what's required. Because I think a lot of times if, if you're running fast and heavy, just keeping up with everything, you don't go and say, well, how, off, how fast would you need this bag, this application and these people? And you don't break it down like that. You're just making sure you got a copy of everything so nobody, nothing blows up and you're all good. Um, so it, it comes down to having that conversation with the business to find out exactly what kind of regulations they're under. When do they need things back? Do they need it back instantly? Do they need, because that dictates what type of backup application you get, not just what type of backup medium you use, although the you application also, will go with the medium, user right? expectations you, as well. You also have to ask that question about different failures. That a, a, you know, my, my recovery target for a server dying in the data center is different than the data center burning down. I'm not going to have. How many data centers I'm, have you seen burn down? Because you've said that a whole bunch of times. Three. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> Don't let Howard near your data center. He sent two of them on Twitter. So, I, I, had a, I had a consulting client was a precious metals recycler, and their main business was grinding up photographic film to recover the silver. Okay. They got a truckload of nitrate film. Oh, oh boy. That was marked safety stock. Oh. Now, the nitrate film is nitrocellulose. It's the explosive that shoots the shell out of a naval gun. <laughs> and they put that in the chopper and chopped it up. And they had a three-bay loading dock in the front with a steel beam that went across the top. When I got there three days later, the middle of that beam was touching the ground. But both ends were still up. <laughs> So to answer your Big question, <laughs> so to get back on topic and answer your question, um, I'm going to do this in the most generic terms as possible because <laughs> of, uh, it's not a vendor uh, showcase. But I think what you have to do is, you know, the, the discussion around backups has really been dictated by the capability of, of how you can get a backup window. And so if you need lower RTOs and lower RPOs, let's talk about RPOs, uh, then you, you have to look at a different tool set that can do more of a continuous data replication that can get you closer to the RPO window that you're looking for. And uh, there are yeah. tools out there that do that now. And I'll just add the, uh, I disagree a little bit with Gina about having the conversation with the business per application. For most enterprise I've worked with, that would be 3,000 conversations. It is. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would state that experience has taught me that setting three to five SLA tiers and forcing the application owners to fit within those tiers and then building a design around that is typically the most expedient way to get uh, SLA-driven data protection well, and then just available. Thanks for being so literal protected too there. First. I appreciate that. Um. <laughs> well, it is Chris. <laughs> well, There's a question. Oh, yeah. So I've heard a lot of talk about business continuity and backing up data in the business. I don't want to belittle or downplay that importance, but what about personal information? Backing up personal information, protecting that. Nick, sorry. Before, before I joined Mark. Vendorland, I worked, uh, spent five years at a healthcare company that, in the middle of that five years, we went public. So a big part of that had to do with amount, a lot of PHI or patient health information uh, in that or big Oracle database instance that we had. So there were, were, was your question around security specifically or was it? Your own personal. My own pictures, my tax returns, my bills, my whatever, my personal information that I find important to have that. So, so stepping outside of the enterprise oh, data sure. protection scheme and getting down to individual or consumer data protection. You're your own enterprise, I would say. So what's, yeah. what's, if it's important, so yeah. I'll, 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 
I have an 8 bay Synology NAS that runs at home. I run a headless crash plan client on it. It's also got a USB drive hanging off the back of it that runs the native Synology backup, but I'm also syncing all the time up to crash plan. So as a consumer, without, that's not being a vendor, I'm, yeah, and I've got stuff going all the way back to the mid 90s from high school and college. So my point was really about, you know, I know it's showcased primarily about business, but I'm also asking really what is there any trend in there? Is there anything that you guys are seeing? Absolutely. I'd say it's more, and I think backup people, people that do this for a living are the worst. I think that it's just, it kind of mirrors what people do in their, in, in their jobs and in, in their businesses, they don't back up. I mean, for me, I use Dropbox. I've used it forever and ever and ever, and that's what I use. Everything goes to Dropbox. But you know, as I think about my mom, I don't think she would ever ha have that on her phone or on the pictures she takes of the grandkids and all that. So I would say it's probably more along the lines of nobody backs anything up still except for nerds like him. Well, the easy use too, I mean, SAS fits in really well with that. So, you know, use iCloud and Google. Yeah, there's... Let it auto set it's, it. it. It's been four or five years now, there have been good solutions yeah. and we got 2% penetration because nobody, ever, you know, consumers just don't, yeah, I don't have the visceral fear of data loss. Nick mentioned Crash Plan, I believe. They've been a sponsor at VMworld for years, and you go by their booth, you get a card and you get a year free from them for personal. They don't want to be called Crash Plan anymore, they Code 42. Code 42. So just to their sure their product good. is Crash Plan. They are Code for, Thank you. Very good, Nick. <laughs> but but I, I, I use them as well, personally. Yeah, I also use an, an older product called, um, oh, I'm drawn a blank because they got bought by Rackspace and Jungle Disk. Jungle, oh. Jungle Disk was one. So I use Crash Plan just your socks. and Jungle Disk and Google Drive and my Synology because I was one of those backup guys. I've got a RAID 5 at home. I don't need anything else. Mm. Double disk failure, done. Lost one episode or one, one period of a dozen or so pictures that my wife was about ready to divorce me over. And mm. so I don't do that anymore. I'm not, three, two, one, there's not enough there. It's like seven, <laughs> two, one. <laughs> so, but, but I think the integration of Google Drive or uh, specifically OneDrive into the yeah. Windows 8, Windows 10, you're starting to see that. Uh, Google Drive is getting bigger and bigger for less and less. You've got Dropbox making both enterprise products as well as consumer products. These are all nice, but we hit on it several times without really going into it, which was the security of the data. And one of the things that I've seen over and over again is people getting CryptoLocker, and it enciphers the stuff locally, and then happens to be your sync disk or your sync directory and so your cloud copy is now enciphered and this this is th that's that's why we want to take out network mapped drives it will not take out unc mapped drives yeah but i actually had a friend of mine who was like um i got this thing in my computer and i'm like oh you're gonna waste some money now and hope you get it back <laughs> yeah, but but the fact that crypto locker won't do that on UNC mapped drives doesn't mean the next one. I was going to say that's just that's just a code <laughs> and, fix and, away. And so and so you so we have just told the next hacker, look, here's an opportunity for you to make some more bitcoins. I wanted to, um, but the, the distinction between sync and share and backup is important here. That sync and share is really like a file server, and if you screw it up in one place, that screw up propagates through all your sinks. But it does depend on which it, yeah, provider some of them you do have, versioning. because if you've got one that does real versioning, not fake versioning, then once you've crypto locked, you just roll everything back. But And if you have backups, you can roll everything back to the last and good backup too. I wanted to go back to your one of your points as well. Um, so you mentioned the influence that the consumer has on things that happen in the enterprise. Is that kind of where you were going with that? A little bit, yeah. I just wanted to understand from your perspectives, uh, what's, have you seen trending? I mean, this space, OneDrive, Google Drive, all that stuff is, is really yeah. everywhere. You hear it in the business, you hear it uh, through an organization or working for an organization, becoming more smart due to the fact that, okay, yeah, we should back this up. Disaster recovery plans, like people are starting to become more aware of it. So are they taking that to the private sector as well? And you know what? I, I do want to see my, my, uh, my Maui pictures 
Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, there's some interesting data I found earlier this year, which was 36% uh, of IT practitioners are now in the what you would consider the millennial group, and they are almost at the majority now, transcending the Gen Xers at this point. So they bring an interest as this new generation of admins and engineers rolls in to manage these data centers. They're also bringing with them a lot of the stuff that the iPhone and uh, technology like that has brought, the simplicity of just clicking a button and something working. So we've seen a lot of technologies over the last four or five years spawn up. If you could really wrap it around the umbrella of simplicity. And I think that's a big deal. With data protection in mind in general, I think uh, you said iCloud or something like that. So a lot of these syncing services that people are used to, I think well, that's really one of the big reasons they've become so prolific, is we're actually seeing a whole new generation step into the data center now. Yeah, and Dropbox has actually helped force that shadow IT to force IT to do something about it. Right. Because it's so easy to use, and you started losing the data you need to protect. So when the VP crashes their stuff, you have no control of that data. Not even that's a big security thing as well. So exactly. public health care, again, it's the minute somebody starts putting documents, you know, malpractice lawsuit or something in their Dropbox to sync somewhere else, yeah. they've now done something that is technically illegal and could be sued, right, oh, by, but, by the company. But, but the it's much broader than that because oh, sure, every, sure, sure. every sales guy has the customer list in yep. his Dropbox. Yeah. Sure. And when you fire him, and he goes to your competitor, there it is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the thing about, is, is one interesting thing about spanning, but that's what users will do. If, if users can't do what they need to do to get the job done, they've already got these technologies now at their fingertips, they're gonna share with Google Drive, they're gonna send messages over Facebook chat, they're gonna do whatever they have to do to send the docs around to get work done. It, so it's it's, ex what they it's do. exactly like we bought PCs in the 80s. Well, Shannon's got the point is that we had this shadow IT that's using Dropbox and it's pushing real IT to respond to it. So that's why there is Dropbox Enterprise. That's why ShareFile exists. That's why all of these opportunities are out there to do the right thing by giving the functionality to people so that, as Nick says, you stay legally compliant by using the enterprise offered sync capability while still maintaining the functionality. So that's all real good ways of we, we've kind of gotten out of the data protection and getting into data availability, right. which is a completely different scenario. The data is not in a failure state. It's how do I get at it to do the work that I need to do, and then mobility and all that. That's a co completely different concept. We could we could probably do another hour long panel just on availability. Right. There, uh, well, there's want... business. There's there's business acceptance of the downtime, but there's also with these consumer based products what's the pressure actually from the real user base? If they well, can actually get it over to Dropbox and bring it back and not have to deal with IT, that's what they're it. gonna do. And, and a lot of that, in the, the pressure that gets to that depends on where are you in the org chart. Mm -hmm. Because if you're really high in the org chart, then number one, you're probably allowed to do things that people lower in the org chart are not allowed to do, or at least you'll do them and not get fired for it, <laughs> whereas, and then the urgency of getting assistance in recovering your data is probably a little different. That, you know, um, if it's the, the spreadsheet with the baseball team roster on it is lost by a senior VP, it gets back much faster than if it's just somebody in the typing pool. That's the nature of business, right? I just want to add one other question, or I guess more comment. So I hear data, 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 and you mentioned feed, which is actually backing up the entire Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not just data that we have to be looking at, also services that are provided by the server. If the server goes offline, how fast can we restore that server? State, yeah. Two ways you can attack that. You can back up every single virtual machine that you want to, or if it's more generic, like you were saying, uh, DHCP or Active Directory or something, just keep a template, keep a clone. You don't have to worry about backing it up. You just spin up a new one. Well, a virtual like machine is nothing more than a collection of files yeah. and data. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing. Many different ways you could go at it. <laughs> and, and really, that's what gives us some of the flexibility in a virtual environment to back up entire machines, is we do have that. Yeah. That's not to say that there aren't backup products that do a you know, a, a 
bare metal restore type of backup, but there's a little more gyrations involved rather than just pointing it at your management server, i.e. vCenter. So there's some nice advantages that we get all over the place with virtualization. And so. yeah. Any other comments, questions? So uh, with all that uh, sync and share and uh, private uh, and uh, enterprise data is uh, mixing together and using different tools from different vendors, uh, do, do, do we see a trend that uh, we are losing or we are eliminating the sensitive, sensitivity to security of data? So Absolutely. for the people that yeah. may not have heard it, um, yeah. the question is now that we're, we've gotten to the point of doing all these backups, are we losing our, our sense of security of the data itself? You see uh, Target downstairs still running just fine. Their stock doing okay. A number of other companies, security's dead. Nobody gives a crap if there's breaches anymore. <laughs> well, there's these companies some, uh, uh, certainly, do better on their certainly stock. Certainly end users have never cared about security. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the problem with shadow IT is just that. And we, as professional IT, have to offer those users a good enough solution that implements security, or we will never get them to not use the not good enough solutions that have no security at all. Yeah. Or you just put in your EULA that no one can try to test the security of your Oracle product and then <laughs> litigate against them if they do. So. And it, it's so kind of a truth. There's a reason that uh, encrypt, hard drive encryption exists. There's a reason that um, encryption exists for a lot of the, the platforms that orchestrate the backups for you. Uh, that stuff is out there and you see it all the time. Uh, there, so I wouldn't say that nobody cares about security anymore. I think particular companies care about it more because of the kind of data that they house, uh, privacy information and things like that. So any of the major verticals, manufacturing, oil and gas, healthcare, et cetera, financial especially, uh, you'll see a much bigger emphasis on security than a, a smaller shop that is just doing share files and stuff like that. Although I still think, you know, users are going to be users, and information wants to be unencumbered, whether that's good for business or not. Mm -hmm. So more and more, I think it's important to build things that users can use easily that also meet all of the requirements of, um, of how secure that data has to be for whatever industry or vertical you're in. Data is non-sentient. I don't care what it wants. That's because you're an old storage guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it comes, the, it the comes truism, down, though, it the comes truism down though, to is a risk we've assessment. Got, we've, got, we've got security versus convenience, yeah. right? And, and so that's, if I that's have a risk assessment. You, you need yeah. to yeah. figure it out. That's a slider. What, yeah. Exactly. And, and it's how important like, is the data? Secure is not necessarily um, much less convenient. How, what, what's the value if you lose that data? And what's the penalty involved? Whether it's an internal IT performance or a compliant sort of fine type. Figure out what the risk is, what it's going to cost you if, if something doesn't work, and then the company makes a decision. You say, well, you know, it, it's going to cost a lot more to change the way we're doing business and, and encrypt everything and do blah, blah, blah. And, and if there is a breach, it's only going to cost us the small amount, the, the security to, to do it right costs more. Some and, companies and are saying, well, what is, I, what is I can't sad, afford to put antivirus on every single machine. That's What is sad is that a lot of the products that we use today, by default, the data that is written is unencrypted, and all it takes is maybe one or two extra clicks to put in an encryption key and start using it. And the frequency with which I go in as a consultant and see that not done yeah. is stunning because, well, I do, I'm doing my backups locally, and I'll, I'll send a copy off to the cloud somehow, but I, did, I don't need that encrypted. Yeah, but I don't need to hack Amazon and de-encrypt a file. All I have to do is call and pretend to be IT and have someone email me a sensitive file. Mm -hmm. It yeah. could be encrypted nine ways from Sunday, but it doesn't matter if I just people hack in and get the data. Yeah. So the moment someone can read data, it's as a security vulnerability. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think also one other thing is um, your question about um, uh, simplicity being driven by consumers into the enterprise. I think the other ways happened as well when it comes to security. I think a lot of the functionality for security has been come from enterprise IT, and we're now see, starting to see it mainstream in, uh, you know, File Vault on Macs or BitLocker, which don't ever use it. It's horrible. Uh, <laughs> other things uh, that are coming out that are, you know, more encryption as encryption becomes more pervasive and, and simple to implement. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these security things find their way down onto. Uh, consumer devices and laptops and things of those natures. So it's almost as if they're doing 
they're crossing the paths with each other. Yeah. It'll ca- I mean, it, it eventually will catch up. What's happened is, you know, you started talking about the tapes. Um, these options weren't out there that we have now. No. iCloud wasn't around, or, you know, the, the Dropboxes weren't around. But the, uh, the convenience of having them is going to drive eventually, as you're, you know, you're talking about, the security will catch up. And it has to be just as easy as right. Dropbox. Wow, You're talking about turning on encryption and those type things. It's it's that's hard to do. Nobody wants to keep track of their right their Nobody key wants to do right. That. So it has if to you be lose easier. that. You lose your data essentially. Okay. But that's our job as the IT guys to right. manage that stuff for them. Unfortunately, it's spread out further than our control most of the time. I mean, the whole idea of shadow IT is it's out of our control. But what it exists because the to Howard's point earlier, yeah, it exists it's, because it's be enterprise IT has not come up with a simple enough solution right, right. to but, supplant those. Well, it may not even but be remember, a question. Shadow IT is not new. No, no. no this no. is this. You know, I led the PC revolution in organizations, and at Citibank, we sold PCs, and the PO said word processor because only <laughs> IT could buy computers. Right, right. Right? This is exactly the same process, and, mm-hmm. and IT has to respond the same way. Right? IT now runs every PC in every corporate America. Mm-hmm. In 1983, that was not true. PCs were run by the user departments, and it was shadow IT. Mm-hmm. And between the carrot and the stick of going, you know, you can't use your own personal Dropbox, but here's simplicity, and it's just as easy, and you can keep your personal and corporate stuff separate. But if you don't go and hear simplicity and it's just as easy, right. they're not going to listen to the no, you can't. Right. And they shouldn't. Right. I believe almost all of the storage vendors now have also partnered with, uh, with Citrix ShareFile. And to me, it's probably one of the, of the ones that are available, mm-hmm. the best non-consumer offering that's out there. But it does almost anything that any of the ma- mainstream consumer uh, sync and share applications do. So it's, it's catching up in easy use as well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And they've got a mobile app, and they do all, so yeah, right. and, it's and, coming. And you it's can coming. package clients, and you can build yeah. the encryption keys in, and right. you can go here, click mm-hmm. here on the intranet. Yeah. yeah, it has to be that easy, or the end users will find a way around it. So one thing I found interesting when I went to work at Spanning was um, the people that, that in, created it and started it are not data center people. They are software people, and they designed this to be as easy as anything else. That is kind of the whole thing. So and I'm one of the first in, that's worked in the enterprise area with, with them, but that, that's kind of where it's coming from. If you look at a lot of other things, Dropbox is the same way. You look at all of these other things that our users gravitate to because it's so easy. There's also a different model of designing the tools for IT to protect the things that need to be protected that the users really just don't care about. They just want to do their jobs. That's all they want. So I think there's new stuff coming that will, and maybe this is what Nick was talking about with the new people designing stuff and using stuff and creating stuff that'll make it so we can take care of the legal needs and bridge all the gaps where the data can go missing and get corrupted or destroyed or hijacked or whatever, but also just set the users free and let them go work. Good point. Set my people free. Thank you, Nick. I'm glad you like that. <laughs> well, I've kind of run out of steam here, and you guys, no more commentary on data protection? And Well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it. I'd like to thank all my guests for chiming in today including Howard, who decided to volunteer last moment. Thank you guys for coming, spending this third session with us. Appreciate it. And thanks for supporting Opening Acts.